This is the second half of this week's block of scripture, Alma 32 through 35. We will now consider Alma's chapter 33 through 35. Alma chapter 33. 33 verses 1 through 2, the phrase, Behold, ye have said that ye could not worship your God because ye are cast out of your synagogues. Alma's message met with a deep response among them. It, it is true, many did not understand the meaning of his words, but they nevertheless took them to be good. Some wanted to know more of God, their belief in him, and whether or not he was just one or many different beings. Alma had spoken to them of a certain kind of precious fruit which they might pluck from a tree planted as a seed in their hearts. Behold, he told them that if they would water and nourish such a seed, that it would swell and sprout, and that they would fill it grow, and then they must needs that his seed is good. By, careful, by caring for the seed planted in their hearts, they would show by doing so that they had begun to exercise and they had begun to exercise their faith. Concerning these things and many others, they wanted Alma to speak further. Reverting in his mind, Alma remembered the lament of one of their number, apparently their leader, who in his anguish had reached the depths of despair, because not only he but his fellow, also his fellows had been cast out of their synagogues and therefore had no place in which to worship God. They were poor in the things of the world and could contribute little of earthly goods to the priests and leaders of the church. One is reminded of Jacob's words, the prophet Nephi's brother, but woe unto the rich who are rich unto the things of the world. For because they are rich, they have despised the poor, and they are persecute the meek, and their hearts are upon their treasures, wherefore their treasure is their God. And behold, their treasures shall perish with them. First Nephi 9.30 Thus the Zoramites regarded their poor brethren. However, Alma himself was quick to carry home his message of forbearance. You do greatly err, he said unto them, if you suppose you cannot worship God without synagogues or sanctuaries. Search the scriptures, it may be, perchance ye have not understood them when they speak of houses of worship. This implies that even the poor in society had access to holy writ, and the ability to read and understand them. Chapter 33, verses 3 through 11, the phrase, Do you remember to have read that Zenos, the prophet of old, had said concerning prayer or worship? From these verses, written by Zenos in the form of a prayer, literally a psalm of thanksgiving, we obtain a sketch of his prophetic activities. Because of his witness of the Redeemer, Zenos was put to death by his enemies. Alma quotes the psalm because it illustrates the prayer priority of praying whatsoever circumstance one finds itself, be it wilderness, field, home, or closet. In so doing, he placed a special emphasis on the mercy expended, extended to men through the atonement of the Son of God. Alma used the scriptures repeatedly to address the false doctrines taught by the Zoramites. He first dealt with the false notion that you can only pray on the Ramayamton. Using the scriptures, he explained that they could pray and worship God anywhere in their field, wilderness, in their fields, in their houses, and even in their closets. Alma then addressed the fact that all the prophets had testified of the coming of Christ. Chapter 33, verse 4, I prayed... The phrase, I prayed concerning those who were mine enemies, and thou didst turn them to me. It is by the power of charity, the power of love of Christ, a love sought and then bestowed upon the seeker, that disputing parties can be reconciled and differences resolved. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James chapter 5.16 says, and it is through this means that enemies are forged into friends, warring nations into cooperative bodies. Chapter 33, verse 11, the phrase, Thou didst hear me because of mine afflictions and my sincerity. How often afflictions lead some to sincerity. When our souls have been stretched, when our bodies and our hearts have been racked with pain and frustration, when our present hopes have been dashed, when there is no place to go but to God for comfort, at such a time our words more truly reflect and mirror the soul's sincere desire. Chapter 33, verse 11, the phrase, And it is because of thy son that thou hast been merciful unto me. 
Zenus, Zenoch, Zeus, and Nahum, prophets on the brass plates whose words are not in our Bible, had the gospel in its purity and preached with that same purity. Their messages are gospel-centered and Christ-centered. Their understanding of God and the Godhead is like our own. They believed in the God, the Eternal Father, and the Son, Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, and in the Holy Ghost. They worshipped and prayed to the Father in the name of the Son, and they sought and preached forgiveness of sin through the condescension and mediation of that sinless Son of Man. Chapter 30. I'm sorry, this would be chapter 33. Let's fix that. Whoops. Chapter 33, verses 12 through 21. The phrase, do you believe those scriptures which have been written of them of old? No doctrine is more fundamental to true Christianity than that of the divine sonship of Christ, nor has any doctrine been subject to more perversion and sophistry in the creeds of men than the relationship of the Son to the Father. On this matter, the Old Testament is virtually silent, and the New Testament, without the aid of modern revelation, may be confusing. In the Old Testament, there are many references to Christ's birth, ministry, death, and resurrection, but few plain statements that he would be begotten of the paternal father and thus be his little offspring. In the midst of a passage that is clearly messianic, the Lord says of the seed of David, I will be his father, and he shall be my son. In the second Psalms, we read of this Lord attesting, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. It is, however, to the Book of Mormon that we turn to be taught this doctrine in plainness. In the present instance, Alma quotes both Zenos and Zenoch as teaching that the mercy of God is to be manifest through his Son. We are also reminded that some 600 years before the earthly advent of Jesus Christ, Nephi saw in vision his mother Mary bearing the divine child in her arms and heard the angel declare unto him to be the Son of the Eternal Father. Prophesying of the Savior's birth, Alma the Younger described Mary as a precious chosen vessel who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost and bring forth a son, yea, even the Son of God. Similarly, King Benjamin told his people that the Lord Omnipotent would come down from, him, would come down from heaven and take upon himself a tabernacle of clay. He shall be called Jesus Christ, he said, the Son of God the Father of heaven and earth, the creator of all things from the beginning, and his mother shall be called Mary. Chapter 33, verse 19, the phrase, a type, was raised up in the wilderness. Because of the ancient Israelites murmuring in the wilderness, the Lord sent venomous serpents to humble the spiritually poisoned. Many people died, and, repent, and the repentant people turned to their prophet and pled with him to ask the Lord to remove the serpents. God told Moses to make a serpent of brass and elevate it on a pole. The Lord promised that everyone who looked upon the raised serpent would be healed. The brazen serpent held up by Moses was a type or shadow of Christ. Many who were bitten by the serpent died, but those who looked to the brazen serpent were healed. In this manner, those who look to Christ after they have been poisoned by sin and waywardness promoted by the serpent are freed from sin and live the abundant life. Some among the ancient Israelites, however, just like some in our day, refused to look to Christ, either because of, either because of the simpleness of the way. You would think that just sheer curiosity and you got nothing to lose would cause you to turn and look. But some were so stubborn, they would not even turn their head to look. As some are stubborn today and will not turn their heads and look in the Book of Mormon for Christ. Chapter 33, verses 22 through 23. The beginning of Alma 33 records that those of whom Alma had delivered his marvelous discourse about planting the seed of faith and attending the experiment on the word inquired of him how they should plant the seed or the word in which he had spoken. Alma responded by quoting the Thanksgiving Psalm of Zenos, a passage from Zenoch, and the story of Moses raising a snake upon a pole and inviting those affected by poisonous snakes to look upon it. Having done this, Alma testified that salvation comes only by belief in the Son of God. That is, salvation comes only to those who embrace the doctrine that Christ is literally God's Son.
Alma then attests that all other doctrines of salvation grow out of the doctrine of Christ's divine sonship. He cites the doctrines of the atonement, resurrection, and judgment as natural appendages to the doctrine of divine sonship. If Christ is literally the Son of the Eternal Father, He can work out an infinite and eternal atonement. He can lay down His life and take it up again, and by so doing He can lay claim to the right to sit in judgment upon all for whom He made that everlasting sacrifice. If on the other hand He is not the Son of a mortal woman, an eternal and glorified man, He is without the ability to take up His life again, for mortals have no such power. Thus there is no faith in salvation save that faith which centers in Christ as God's Son. Chapter 33, verse 23, the phrase that your burdens may be light. Our burdens become light as we shed them through the atonement of Christ, as we yoke ourselves everlastingly to him who bore the greatest burden of all. The Master said, Come unto me, all ye that labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Lord's yoke, his strengthening tie and lifeline to us, is customized. Soothes perfectly and precisely to those who in sincerity seek to follow him. Discipleship is personal, not competitive. Rather, he who knows the hearts and minds of men and women chooses the challenges and orchestrates the opportunities that will result in optimal learning and maximum development. There is no weight in life greater than the burden of sin. The Master beckons to us to burden, unburden ourselves of the taints of a celestial world and adorn ourselves with the robes of righteousness. He invites us to shed the superficial Disregard the ephemeral, ephemeral and the transient and eschew the cheap and the gaudy. Chapter 33, verse 23, the phrase, All this can ye do if ye will. Agency has a central issue in the first estate, the matter over which the war in heaven was fought. God wants all of his children to return to him, but not through coercion or unrighteous dominion. Theirs is the choice. As him 20, 240 eloquently teaches, Know this, that every soul is free to choose his life and what he'll be. For this eternal truth is given, that God will force no man to heaven. He'll call, persuade, direct aright, right, and bless with wisdom, love, and light. In nameless ways be good and kind, but never force the human mind. Freedom and reason make us men. Take these away, what are we then? Mere animals and just as well. The beast may think of heaven or hell. May we no more our powers abuse, but ways of truth and goodness choose. Our God is pleased when we improve his grace and seek his perfect love. Let's now go to Alma chapter 34. 34 verses 2 through 8, the phrase, I think that it is impossible that you should be ignorant of these things which have been spoken of concerning the coming of Christ. Amulek immediately began his discourse by painstakingly reminding the Zoramites of Christ, whom they as well as he and his companions knew as the Son of God. Of Christ, Amulek said that the Zoramites could not be ignorant. His coming, which was now proclaimed anew by the missionaries, had been taught freely unto them while they while yet they were numbered as members of God's church in Zarahemla, and from which they had separated. Verse 3, however, to impress upon the minds of those who had come to them for advice concerning a place of worship, God now, now that they had been deprived of the use of their synagogues, Amalek noted to them that Alma hath exhorted unto you faith and patience. Alma's Discourse on Faith is a classic. It sets forth the terms and conditions by which faith in Christ is developed. It focus, focuses upon how one who is lacking in faith may, through the divine experiment, grow from desire to believe, through a hope that there is and shall be a Christ, to the point at which that person's faith is perfect, and he or she is able to eventually to partake of the fruit of the tree of life. Alma's plea with the Zoramites is to be patient with that which they do not know at present, to wait upon the Lord, trust in his infinite and eternal purposes. And that is the same plea of the prophets today. Brothers and sisters, we must be patient and wait patiently 
upon the Lord, to learn line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, not all at once. Verse 4, Amnet continued to use Alma's metaphor concerning planting the word in your heart. The word as used here is faith in Christ. Like a seed, it will swell and grow in your hearts, even so nourish it by faith. Then wait for the Lord, and you will see that it is good, that it will grow into a mighty tree, springing up unto you, up unto you everlasting life. Verse 5, to plant the word in their hearts was to let the idea, the concept that Jesus is the Christ and that he shall come into the world rest in their minds and hearts, and then to ponder, pray, and thus test its truthfulness. Verses 6 through 8, Alma and Amalek were quick to see and realize that what perturbed the Zoramites most was whether faith was to be exercised in the Son of God or its alternative, there shall be no Christ. Amulek also noted to the Zoramites that Alma had proved unto them many times that faith in Christ is unto salvation. Amulek cited, as Alma also had done before him, the prophet Zenos and Zenoch and Moses to prove that these things are true. Verse 8, Amulek, now that the proper time had come, joined his own testimony with that of the prophets of old in declaring that these things are true. Chapter 34, verse 9, the phrase, it is expedient that atonement should be made. The atonement was not simply a nice thing, a sweet offering of a gentle and kind man. It was and is absolutely necessary. Though Christ's atonement was, voluntarily, was a voluntary offering, though he suffered and laid down his life of his own free will, what he did needed to be done. All eternity hung in the balance until it was accomplished reality. Had there been no atonement, no amount of goodness, no amount of caring, nor concern, no amount of human strength could have made up the difference. We are forever indebted to him who bought us with his blood. Chapter 34, verse 9, the phrase, All are hardened, yea, all are fallen, are lost. Because of the fall of Adam and Eve, all the children of men inherit the conditions of mortality, including a fallen nature. They are oblivious to things of righteousness, are hardened and insensitive to matters spiritual, are lost and alienated from the family of God. Adam fell, Elibird from McConkie has written. We know that this fall came because of transgression, and that Adam broke the law of God, became mortal, and was thus subject to sin and disease and all the ills of mortality. We know that the effects of his fall passed upon all his posterity. All inherited a fallen state, a state of mortality, a state in which spiritual and temporal death prevailed. In this state, all men sin, all are lost, all are fallen, all are cut off from the presence of God. Such a way of life is inherent in this mortal existence. Further, spiritual death passes upon all men when they become accountable for their sins. Being thus subject to sin, they die spiritually. They die as pertaining to the things of the Spirit. They die as pertaining to the things of righteousness. They are cast out of the presence of God. It is of such men that the Scriptures speak when they say that the natural man is an enemy to God. Chapter 34, verses 10 uh, through 14. It must, that 110 should be gone. Sorry about that. The phrase, it must needs be an infinite and eternal sacrifice. The atonement of Jesus Christ is eternal and infinite. First, it is infinite in the sense that it is timeless, embracing past, present, and future. Our Savior is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and the effects of his atonement reach back to Eden and forward to the millennium's end. Adam and Eve were taught to call upon God in the name of the Son for remission of their sins by virtue of an atonement which would be worked out some 400 years hence. Enoch saw and bore witness some 300 years before the events of Gethsemane and Calvary. The righteous is lifted up. The lamb is slain from the foundations of the world. Jesus Christ offered himself a ransom for sin in one singular moment in earth's history, so that as many as would believe and be baptized in his holy name and endure in faith to the end should be saved. 
not only those who believe after he came in the meridian of time in the flesh, but all those from the beginning, even as many as were before he came, who believed in the words of the holy prophets, as well as those who would come after, who should believe in the gifts and callings of God, the Holy Ghost, which beareth record of the Father and the Son. Those who lived before the meridian of time were taught to repent and believe in the name of the Holy One, to look forward unto the Messiah and believe in him to come as though he had already was. Second, the atonement of Christ is infinite in a sense that it conquers the most universal reality in mortal existence, death. The earth and every plant and animal thereupon, all forms of life, are subject to death through the fall. The light of the atonement must shine upon all who were previously shadowed by the effects of the fall. And if an atonement must bring life to all that is subject to death, physical death. Third, the atonement is infinite in that it encompasses all the word, worlds Christ created. Jesus Christ as Jehovah advanced and progressed in the premortal existence to the point at which he, under the direction of Elohim, became the creator of countless worlds and became known as the Lord Omnipotent. And speaking of those orbs formed by the Jehovah, God said to Moses, And by the word of my power have I created them, which is my only begotten Son, who is full of grace and truth. And worlds without number have I created, and I also created them for my own purpose. And by the Son I created them, which is my only begotten. And then, in discussing the role of the Son in the redemption and glorification of these worlds, their passing away, the divine word continued, But only an account of this earth and the inhabitants that I have give I unto you. For behold, there are many worlds that have passed away by the word of my power, and there are many that now stand, and innumerable are they unto man. But all things are numbered unto me, for they are mine, and I know them. Likewise, in the vision of the glories, the Lord explained that by Christ and through him and of him, the worlds, plural, are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are sons, begotten sons and daughters unto God. Brothers and sisters, you see why he swept blood from every poor? He not also suffered the sins of this world, but the sins and afflictions for all the worlds Christ has created. Oh, how great thou art! that we sing and we should sing. Fourth, the atonement of Jesus Christ is infinite because Christ himself is an infinite being. From his mother Mary, a mortal woman, he inherited mortality, the capacity to die. On the other hand, he inherited from his father, the almighty Elohim, immortality, the power to live forever. The suffering and sacrifice in Gethsemane on the Golgotha were undertaken by a being who was greater than man, one possessing the powers of a god. This was no human sacrifice, not even simply an act of a wise and all-loving teacher. It was more, infinitely more, than an example of submission or a model of humanitarianism. He did for us what no other being could do. Yes, it is true, there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. But it is equally true that what Jesus of Nazareth accomplished in and through the awful atonement is beyond human comprehension. It is the work of an infinite personage. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, defined the scope of the infinite eternal sacrifice of the Lord, saying, quote, When the prophet speaks of an infinite atonement, they mean just that. Its effects cover all men, the earth itself, and all forms of life thereon, and reach out into the endless expanse of eternity. Boy, brothers and sisters, that is incomprehensible. Elder Russell M. Nelson, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, enumerated some of the ways the atonement of Jesus Christ is infinite. Quote, His atonement is infinite without an end. It was also infinite in that all humankind would be saved from never-ending death. It was infinite in terms of his immense suffering. It was infinite in time, putting an end to the preceding prototype of animal sacrifice. It was infinite in scope. It was to be done once for all. And the mercy of the atonement extends not only to the infinite number of people, but also the infinite number of worlds created by him. 
it was infinite beyond any human scale of measurement or mortal comprehension. Jesus was the only one who could offer such an infinite atonement since he was born of a mortal mother and an immortal father. Because of that unique birthright, Jesus was an infinite being. End of quote. Chapter 34, verse 10, the phrase, a great and last sacrifice. Christ's atonement was the great and last in terms of its spiritual significance, its impact, its timeliness, and eternal everlasting relevance, not necessarily in terms of its chronology. John the Baptist, as a part of his prayer of ordination upon the heads of Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowder, explained that the Aaronic priesthood shall never be taken again from the earth until the sons of Levi do offer again an offering unto the Lord in likewise, in, in righteousness. Likewise, a modern revelation speaks of the sons of Moses and the sons of Aaron offering an acceptable sacrifice in the temple to be erected in Independence, Jackson County, Missouri. That's Dr. Cohen, CD 431. So we are still yet to restore the law of sacrifice, of offering animal sacrifice. That is yet to still be restored. Joseph Smith taught the offering of sacrifice has ever been connected and forms part of the duties of the priesthood. It began with the priesthood and will continue until after the coming of Christ. These sacrifices, as well as every ordinance belonging to the priesthood, will when the temple of the Lord shall be built and the sons of Levi be purified, be fully restored and attended to in all their powers, ramifications, and blessings. This ever did and ever will exist when the powers of the Melchizedek priesthood are sufficiently manifest. Else how can the restoration of all things spoken of by the holy prophets be brought to pass? It is not to be understood that the law of Moses will be established again with all its rites and variety of ceremonies. This has never been spoken of by the prophets, but those things which existed prior to Moses' day, namely sacrifice, will be continued. It may be asked by some, what necessity for sacrifice since the great sacrifice was offered? In answer to which, if repentance, baptism, and faith existed prior to the days of Christ, what necessity for them since that time? End of Joseph Smith's quote. It may be that such a sacrifice as a part of the restitution of all things will be instituted one final time to point towards the great and last sacrifice of Jesus the Lamb. Chapter 34, verses 10 through 11. The phrase, not a sacrifice of man, it should not be a human sacrifice. As we have observed, Jesus Christ was more than man, more than human. He was God. And thus the sacrifice was infinite in the sense that it was not limited by what puny man can do. That is, no, that is, no mortal man can do such a thing. But Jesus Christ, the Son of Man of Holiness, was empowered through conception to accomplish his foreordained task. Chapter 34, verse 12, the phrase, The law requireth the life of him who hath murdered. There is no man, Amulek argued, that could have his own blood shed or that can sacrifice it to a man totally for the sins of another. A man can in no way expiate or make complete satisfaction for, atone for, the offenses of others. There is among us a law, he said, which is just. It requires that a man who murdereth forfeit his own life in expiation thereof. But it will not demand in reconciliation of that offense the life of his brother. For that reason, and we may be sure for it alone, a sacrifice which is all-inclusive, that is, a sacrifice which will suffice for the sins of the world. Chapter 34, verse 13, a stop to the shedding of blood. When the resurrected Lord appeared to the Nephites, he told them, I am the light and the life of the world. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And ye shall offer up no more unto me the shedding of blood. And ye shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Sacrifice required in the law of Moses will be fulfilled and done away. But a mention mentioned earlier, sacrifices instituted before the law of Moses will be restored as a part of the restitution of all things. In our day, that same Lord has commanded, Thou shalt offer a sacrifice unto the Lord God in righteousness, even that of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Chapter 34, verse 14, the phrase, Every whit 
pointing to the great and last sacrifice. The law of Moses was one grand prophecy of Christ, inasmuch as it testified of the salvation to be obtained in and through his atoning blood. Jesus was the fulfillment of that prophecy. Ella Bruce R. McConkie states, quote, Everything connected with the lesser law pointed to the higher law, or in other words, it pointed to Christ and his gospel. Each mosaic performance was so arranged and so set up that it was a type and a shadow of what was to be. Their sacrifices were performed in similitude of the coming sacrifice of their Messiah. The rituals out of which they gained forgiveness of sins were tokens of what was to be in the life of him whose atonement made forgiveness possible. Their every act, every ordinance, every performance, all that they did, pointed the hearts and minds of believers, believing worshipers forward to Jesus Christ and him crucified. All this was understood by those among them who were faithful and true. The rebellious and slothful were like their modern counterparts, unbelieving, non-conforming, unsaved. As noted earlier, the atonement was infinite because Christ was an infinite being. The animal sacrifices, the feasts and festivals, and other daily rituals were full of numerous types and shadows pointing the children of Israel to Christ. The sacrament similarly reminds us of the atoning mission of Christ. So we have one, the law of Moses, pointing to Christ. We have the other, the sacrament, pointing back in remembrance of Christ. Likewise, anciently, Passover was usually reminded that the Lord brought Israel out of bond, physical bondage in Egypt. Today, Easter is a yearly reminder that through the atonement and the resurrection of the Lord, we can be redeemed out of spiritual bondage. Chapter 34, verse 15, the phrase, He shall bring salvation to all those who shall believe on his name. When the risen Redeemer introduced himself to the astonished Nephites gathered near the temple site in the land of shortly after his resurrection, many other things he said of himself were, I came unto my own, and my own received me not. And the scriptures concerning my coming are fulfilled, and as many as have received me, to them have I given to become the sons of God. And even so will I to as many as shall believe on my name. For behold, by my redemption cometh, and in me is the law of Moses fulfilled. I am the life and light of the world. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And ye shall offer up unto me no more the shedding of blood. Yea, your sacrifice and your burnt offerings shall be done away. For I will accept none of your sacrifices and your burnt offerings. He shall make eternal life or exaltation available to believe and obey, and through the merits of mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah, a means, a way, a path is provided whereby man can forsake sin and a sinful nature, come unto Christ, and be perfected in him. 34 verse 16, the phrase, Mercy can satisfy the demands of justice. Justice may be satisfied in two ways. One, keeping the law perfectly, or two, suffering the effects of a broken law. Christ satisfied the demands of justice in both of these ways. He kept the law perfectly for himself and suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross in behalf of those of us who repent, it's because we cannot keep the law perfectly. Those who refuse to repent are exposed to the whole law of the demands of justice. That is, they must face without divine aid the consequences of willful sin. They therefore lose the opportunity for that rehabilitative redemption which can only come through Christ's enabling power. Elder Bruce C. Hafen has provided the following thoughtful insight. He said, quote, I once wondered if those who refuse to repent but who then satisfy the law of justice by paying for their own sins, are then worthy to enter the celestial kingdom? The answer is no. The entrance requirements for a celestial life are simply higher than merely satisfying the law of justice. For that reason, paying for our own sins will not bear the same fruit as repenting of our sins. Justice is a law of balance and order, and it must be satisfied either through our payment or his, meaning Christ. But if we decline the Savior's invitation to let him carry our sins and then satisfy justice by ourselves, we will not yet have experienced the complete rehabilitation that can 
occur through a combination of divine assistance and genuine repentance. Working together, those factors have the power permanently to change our hearts and our lives, preparing for celestial life. That's why the doctrine of progression between the kingdoms is a false doctrine. It is of the devil, brothers and sisters. For one thing, ordinances will not be performed after you're resurrected. Therefore, those in the terrestrial celestial kingdom cannot have ordinances performed for them to enter a celestial kingdom. And the other is this, suffering for your own sins only satisfies the demands of justice. It does not provide the mercy and the growth through repentance that is required for an inheritance in the celestial kingdom. There are two aspects of justice. One, obedience to the law results in blessings that bring joy. Two, disobedience to laws and punishment that brings sorrow. There are two ways to satisfy justice. One, never violate the law, which we can never do. Two, if you do violate the law, pay the penalty. Problem, no flesh is justified by the law. Everyone has sin. Thus, a penalty must be paid. There are two effects of sin. One, by temporal law we are cut off. Justice is violated. Number two, by spiritual law, we perish. There cannot any unclean thing enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus offered himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law, since we cannot do that. Christ initiated the law of mercy, but how? One, he kept the law perfectly and was without sin. He was justified by the law. Two, in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross, he suffered and paid the price for the penalty as though he was guilty of every sin ever committed. He does that in our behalf. Three, he is our advocate with the Father. Chapter 34, verses 15 through 17, the phrase, Faith unto Repentance. While serving as a member of the 70, Elder Robert E. Wells spoke of the faith required to bring changes in our lives sufficient to participate in the atonement of Christ. Quote, Just how much faith do I need for the atonement of Christ to work for me? In other words, how much faith do I need to receive salvation? In the book of Alma, we find the answer. The prophet taught, the prophet Amulek taught this simple but grand principle. The Son of God bringeth about the means unto men that they may have faith unto repentance. Please note those three words, faith unto repentance. That is the clue. Four times in three verses he uses that expression. So the combination of faith in Christ plus faith unto repentance is vitally important. That concept is one of the greatest insights we have into the importance of simple, clear faith. Faith sufficient to repent. Apparently, faith great enough to move mountains is not required. Faith enough to speak in tongues or to heal the sick is not needed. All that is needed is just enough faith to recognize that we have sinned and to repent of our sins, to feel remorse for them and to desire to sin no more, but to please Christ and the Lord. Then the greatest miracle of all, the atonement whereby Christ rescues us from our deserved punishment, is in effect in our behalf. End of his quote. Chapter 34, verses 18 through 26. Amulek may well be paraphrasing the message of the ancient prophet Zenos, quoted earlier by Alma. Zenos taught that the disposition or attitude of the supplicant was far more important than the location of the prayer that the great God could hear and would certainly respond to sincere prayers offered in all places and in places of one's existence. We learn from this pro potent prophetic counsel of let the people of God are perfectly justified in petitioning the Most High for divine assistance in regard to their flocks, herds, fields, meaning more generally their temporal welfare. As long as the saints follow the injunction to seek first the kingdom of God and seek prosperity in order to good do good, they are within the bounds of propriety when they pray in faith for the necessities of life to have sufficient for their needs and circumstances.
Chapter 34, verse 21, the phrase, cry unto him in your homes, yea, over all your household. Few things are of greater import, and thus few things deserve more pleading prayer than the family. Parents and children who pray morning, night for one another, for their health and strength and protection, for their spiritual well-being and growth, will generally find their hearts turning towards home more frequently, and will usually seek an eternal family unit with greater diligence. Chapter 34, verse 22, the phrase, Cry unto him against the power of your enemies. Power over one's enemies need not entail the destruction of one's enemies. Rather, it might take the form of having enemies miraculously transformed into friends. Thou wast merciful, Zenos declared to God, when I prayed concerning those who were my enemies, and thou didst turn them to me. Chapter 34, verse 26, the phrase, This is not all, you must pour out your souls. Is not enough. It is not enough to pray for our families or our crops or our businesses. It is not enough to pray for power over Lucifer. We must also plead with the Lord in silent and secret prayer on behalf of our own souls that the cleansing powers of the Spirit may make us new creatures, new creatures in Christ. We must pray for the gift and guidance of the Spirit, for the inspiration of heaven to accompany us in our daily walk and talk. Chapter 34, verse 27, the phrase, Let your hearts be full, drawn out in prayer unto him continually. The saints of the Most High have a constant prayer in their hearts, a perpetual yearning for the things of God. It is not that they are expected to be uttering prayers beneath their breath every minute of the day, for such could rapidly turn into a meaningless and empty ritual. Rather, in addition to regular prayers in our minds, we are asked to think wholesome thoughts and ponder on worthwhile matters. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good, report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things, as Philippians 4, eight says. The Lord has thus commanded us to let the solemnities of eternity rest upon our minds. Chapter 34, verses 28 through 29, the phrase, If ye turn away the needy and the naked, and visit not the sick and afflicted, and part of your sustenance, behold, your prayer is vain. We are under obligation in some cases to help to bring about the answers to our prayers. It is not enough to pray that God will alleviate the suffering of the hungry, clothe the naked, lift up the hands that hang down, and strengthen the feeble knees. Where possible, we must extend ourselves in Christian service to the needy and less fortunate if we expect to enjoy the peaceful assurance that the Lord is pleased with our offerings. Truly, charity preventeth a multitude of sins. In verse these verses, the phrase, ye are as hypocrites who deny the faith. That is, you who are acting in ways unbecoming a member of the Lord's household, you have not put on Christ and thus are not involved in Christ-like activities. Chapter 34, verse 31, the phrase, now is the day, time and the day of your salvation. In a general sense, Amulek is stating that mortality is a time given to us to prepare for life with God. In a mar narrow sense, he may be suggesting that Zoramites should take advantage of the moment, grab for the opportunity at the present to search out and secure the truth, for time and circumstance will quickly rob them of subsequent opportunities. The phrase, immediately shall the great plan of redemption be brought unto you. Paid people do not need to wait until some distant day in order to enjoy the fruits of gospel living. In fact, the true saints enjoy heaven on earth. Indeed, if we will quickly humble ourselves, call upon the Lord in mighty prayer in behalf of our souls, and submit ourselves to divine will, we can participate directly and immediately in the blessings of the plan of salvation. 34 verse 32, the phrase, the day of this life. Here the word day seems referred to a period of time. Thus Amulek is saying in essence, the period of time in this mortal existence is the time granted us to perform our labors. 34 verse 33, the phrase, you do not procrastinate the day of your repentance. Indeed, procrastination is the thief of eternal life. As a person puts off his repentance until later, he learns to his dismay that the power to change is irreversibly is inversely proportional to the power of habit. The greater the strength of habit, the lesser the strength of change. 
President Joseph Finley Smith taught procrastination as it may be applied to God's principles is the thief of eternal life, which is life in the presence of the Father and the Son. Chapter 34, verse 33, if we, phrase, if we do not improve our time while in this life, this is an unusual phrase, for we generally do not speak of improving our time. We might say if we do not make effective use of our time, or if we do not improve ourselves during this period of time, then it will be too late. Jacob warned against wasting the days of our probation, while Samuel the Lamanite warned against procrastinating the time of our repentance until it is everlastingly too late. Chapter 34, verse 33, the phrase, Then cometh the night of darkness. If we aren't careful, if we do not prepare properly, if we do not focus upon things that matter most, we will eventually become unprepared face to face with death. While the sun shines, we are expected to walk in the light and perform labors to the, appropriate to the light. For sooner than we think, we shall be called upon to pass through the veil which separates the embodied from the disembodied. The spirit world called here the night of darkness is a place where unrighteous works are to be continued, not begun. Elder Dallin H. Oaks implies that the resurrection is the mile post of the end of this life, wherein there can be no labors performed. When he said, in our eternal journey, the resurrection is the mighty mile post that signifies the end of mortality and the beginning of immortality. Chapter 34, verse 33, the phrase, there can be no labor performed. It is not to be understood from these verses that no labors are performed in the post-mortal spirit world after physical death. The Church of the Lamb is organized there. The gospel is preached there to millions, and thus the work of the Lord goes forward on both sides of the veil. If, however, a person has enjoyed the privileged gospel understanding, but chooses in this life to deny or defy that light, to reject the truth and avoid the works of righteousness when he knows better, it becomes extremely difficult for him to turn around to change directions at the time of death. Also, once we are resurrected, there are no labors performed. That is another meaning of this phrase. So you can't get resurrected in a celestial kingdom, be taught the gospel, and then be baptized so that you can go to the celestial kingdom. No, no labors are performed after you are resurrected. Elder Melvin J. Ballard explained that until a person learns to overcome the flesh, his temper, his tongue, his disposition to indulge in the things God has forbidden, he cannot come into the celestial kingdom of God. He must overcome either in this life or in the life to come. But this life is a time in which men are to repent. Do not let any of us imagine that we can go down to the grave, not having overcome the corruption of the flesh, and then lose in the grave all our sins and evil tendencies. They will be with us. They will be with the spirit when separated from the body. The spirit only can repent and change, and then the battle has to go forward with the flesh afterwards. It is much easier to overcome and serve the Lord when both flesh and spirit are combined as one. Every man and woman who is putting off until the next life the task of correcting and overcoming the weakness of flesh are sentencing themselves to years of bondage. For no man or woman will come forth in the resurrection until they have completed their work, until they have overcome, until they have done as much as they can do. End of quote. Chapter 34, verse 34, the phrase, that awful crisis, the crisis of being unprepared to meet one's maker. The phrase, that same spirit will thus possess your bodies. Amulek is here making use of the word spirit to refer to one's disposition, attitude, proclivity, spiritual direction. Men and women will not have an immediate reversal of attitude at the time of death. If they have desired evil things, if they have sold their souls for attention and applause and acclaim, if they have craved carnal pleasures alone, if their lives have followed this course, they need not expect to inherit spirituality in the world to come. This is in harmony with what Alma will later call the doctrine of restoration. In the words of Jacob, Woe unto all those who die in their sins, for they will return to God and behold his face and remain in their sins. 
in a positive vein, if a person leaves this life loving the Lord, questing for the Spirit, striving for truth and light, he will continue in that same direction in the spirit world among persons of like disposition. He will go on to gain eternal life. Chapter 34, verse 34, the phrase, that eternal world. This is a specific reference to the spirit world and not to the life in the kingdoms of glory. As we have seen already, all person will repent. The only questions are where and under what circumstances they will repent, and thus what degree of glory they will obtain. There are no murderers and liars and whoremongers in the celestial kingdom, only repentant murderers liars and whoremongers chapter 34 verse 35 president harold b lee gave the following explanation of alma 34 35 quote to those who die in their wicked state not having repented the scriptures say the devil shall steal them seal them as his own which means that until they have paid the utmost farthing for what they have done, they shall not be redeemed from his grasp. When they shall have been subject to the buffetings of Satan sufficient to have satisfied justice, then shall they be brought forth out of the grasp of Satan and shall be assigned to that place of our fathers, celestial, terrestrial, celestial world, merited by their life here upon this earth. End of quote. Chapter 34, verse 35, the phrase, The Spirit of the Lord hath withdrawn from you. One of the immediate consequences of sin is the withdrawal of the Holy Spirit, a withdrawal which leads to the feelings of guilt and pain and emptiness. Moroni taught that despair cometh because of iniquity. When one is void of holiness, he opens himself to the influence of the unholy. Chapter 34, verse 35, the phrase, This is the final state of the wicked. Telestial persons shall, as we have noted above, eventually repent of their sins, and thus being subject to Satan is not exactly their final state. They shall inherit a kingdom of glory. This verse seems to apply more directly to the sons of perdition, those who have lost all desire and disposition to repent, who have gone beyond the point of no return, who shall be resurrected but to... Who sh Knowing of no return, who shall be resurrected but to a kingdom of no glory, such is their final state. 37, 34 verse 37, the phrase, work out your salvation. In the strictest sense, no one can work out their own salvation. No person can create himself, resurrect, resurrect himself, ransom himself from sin, or cleanse his own heart from the taints of the world. These are the actions of a God of an infinite being. We can seek and ask and petition and supplicate. We can apply his blood, take his name, accept his enabling power, and acquire his nature. But we cannot save ourselves. The saints of God seek above all things for the sanctifying powers of the Spirit in their lives. Through this process, they have their hearts changed. And by this means, the saints, they are motivated to righteous works and the works of God. In that sense, Christ has begun to live in them. Thus Paul implored, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And note how the, the apostles' words, For it is God which worketh in you, both to, the, to will and to do of his good pleasure. Chapter 34, verse 38, the phrase, that ye contend no more against the Holy Ghost. Quench not the Spirit, Paul pleads in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Will ye reject the words of the prophets and quench the Spirit, Jacob asked, and make a mock of the great plan of redemption which hath been laid for you? Know ye not that if ye will do these things, that the power of the redemption and resurrection which is in Christ will bring you to stand with shame and guilt before the bar of God? We now turn to our final chapter, Alma 35, 30, chapter 35, the Nephite Lamanite Wars recorded in Alma 43 through 62. Chronologically, Alma 43 follows 35. Alma being grieved for the iniquities of people, yea, for the wars and bloodsheds, gathers his sons separately to just things pertaining unto righteousness. Mormon specifically noted his interjection of Alma's words to his sons, Helaman, Shiblon, and Corianton, before returning to the account of the wars between Nephites and the Lamanites. Alma 35 explains the build-up 
that led to the Lamanite and Nephite War comprising chapters 43 through 62. The conflict and eventual war may be summarized from Alma 35. 1. The popular part of the Zoramites were angry because of the word, for it just destroyed their craft, meaning priestcraft. 2. The converted Zoramites, being cast out of the land, and there were many, went and dwelt among the people of Jershon, the people of Ammon. Here they were nourished, clothed, given lands to their inheritance, and had all of their wants satisfied. In their previous land, they were looked upon as poor, filthy, and coarse. 3. The kinds of people... The kindness of the people of Jershon receiving the new converts infuriated the Zoramites. The chief ruler of the Zoramites breathed out many threatenings against them. The people of Ammon did fear, further angering the Zoramites and the I'm sorry, the people of Ammon did not fear, further angering the Zoramites and their rulers. Number four, the unconverted Zoramites began to mix with the Lamanites and to stir them also up to anger against the people of Ammon, who were Lamanite converts. The events recorded in Alma 35 reveal how the lengthy Nephite-Lamanite Nephite wars recorded in Alma 43-62 through 62 began. Satan stirred the hearts of the Zoramites to anger. In turn, they influenced the Lamanites and other Nephite descenders to anger and to take up weapons of war against those who were good. Alma 35, 1-14, through 14, as we have... Seen repeatedly in the Book of Mormon, wickedness can have no fellowship with righteousness. The rebellious have no stomach for those who submit to God's will. Frequently, those who shun the light do all they can to expel from their midst and even destroy the children of light. The wicked Zoramites, whose eyes and hearts have been turned aside by their idolatries, their worldly treasures, here move to rid themselves of the poor elements of the society who had opened themselves to the power of the word preached by Alma and Amulek. As with the experience of Paul, their apostolic colleague on another continent, their proclamation of the truth destroys the craft of those who prey upon the innocent and unweary. But the Lord is merciful and is eager to deliver his chosen people, and provision is made by the people of Ammon to protect the lives of and give succor to the new converts of Christianity. See, isn't it interesting that those who are of darkness cannot abide the light and seek to destroy the light? But that light can abide darkness. We don't seek to go about destroying those in darkness. But those in darkness seek those that are in the light. Chapter 35, verses 15 through 16, President Ezra Taft Benson stated, The Book of Mormon, which is the most correct book on earth, demonstrates that the major responsibility for teaching our children the great plan of the Eternal Father, the fall, rebirth, atonement, resurrection, judgment, eternal life, rests with fathers. It should be done individually as well as in families. It should be preached and discussed so our children will know the commandments. It should be done from their youth up and often. May we teach our children as the exemplary Book of Mormon fathers taught their sons, and may they, like Nephi, listen and obey, knowing that because of those teachings, they too were born of goodly parents. End of his quote. Thank you, brothers and sisters. That's the end of our presentation. If it helped you in learning some principles and doctrine, please hit the like button.